The spring thaw of 1924 uncovered a grisly truth within the icy depths of Little Lava Lake, located near the Cascade Mountains west of Bend, Oregon. Beneath the surface lay the frozen bodies of three fur trappers who were reported missing several weeks prior from their woodland cabin. It is a captivating, cold-blooded mystery which remains unsolved for almost a century, the motive unclear and the killer never captured. As winter descended in 1923, three men local to the small city of Bend, Oregon, packed up their belongings to move to an isolated cabin in the woodland of Deschutes National Forest near Little Lava Lake, the trio wishing to spend the winter months fur trapping in the wilderness. There were Edward Nichols, known as Ed, who was 50 years old, Harry Leroy Roy Wilson, aged 35, and the youngest of the group was Edward Morris, nicknamed Dewey, who was 25 years old. Nichols was employed as a caretaker for the cabin and fur foxes, whereas Morris and Wilson, the latter of whom was a Marine Corps veteran, were loggers for the Brooks Scanlon Lumber Company. The pair found fur trapping to be more of a pastime in comparison to Nichols. In the autumn of 1923, they began living in the log cabin, which belonged to a local logging contractor called Edward Logan. Ed Nichols, Roy Wilson and Dewey Morris came to an agreement with Logan that instead of paying rent for their lodgings, they promised to take care of Logan's six foxes, which resided in a pen behind the dwelling. In the week before Christmas, Nichols returned to Bend after a successful fur stint at Little Lava Lake, with a sled packed full of furs to sell. Witnesses who spoke with Nichols recalled that he seemed thrilled with the trio's progress, having collected much more fur than they had originally anticipated. Once all of the furs were sold, Nichols returned to the cabin at Lava Lake. Some sources speculate that Nichols did not travel alone to Bend and that he was joined by his companion Roy Wilson, who allegedly spoke with his mother very briefly, explaining that he would be home in February. The festive season came and went, the people of Bend ringing in the new year with high hopes of a healthy and prosperous 12 months ahead. During January of 1924, a man called Alan Wilcoxon departed from his home in Fall River, his destination being his own resort located in Elk Lake. Having mapped out his 24-mile route, Wilcoxon began his journey, trudging through the rugged terrain by snowshoe. On the 15th of January, he stopped by the log cabin, where he greeted the three men. He spent the night in the trio's company, departing towards Elk Lake the next morning. According to Wilcoxon, Nichols, Wilson and Morris appeared to be in high spirits and good health, with their hunting endeavours being greatly successful. Little did he know that he would be the last person to see the trio alive. As the months passed, the families of the trappers became concerned when they failed to receive any kind of correspondence from them. Searching the forest were Dewey's brother, Owen Morris, family friend, Hervey Innes, and superintendent of the Tumalo fish hatchery, Pearl Lins. Whilst searching the forest, they stumbled upon an unusual scene. They found several activated traps. A number of mink traps had been left untouched, with the corpses decaying in the winter sun. Once the traps were discovered, a full search operation began, with friends and family forming a search party. In April, they made their way towards the cabin by snowshoe, where they were met with an eerie silence. Upon first inspection, the cabin was completely empty. Burned food lay in pots on the stove with moulding cooking utensils and the fire had dwindled to a pile of ashes. Plates and cutlery had been neatly set on the table, however, sat unused. 
It appeared that their last meal had been breakfast. Several sources reported that heavy clothing, traps and rifles lay abandoned within the confines of the cabin and that newspapers and magazines had been carelessly left in a state of disarray, the skin racks and dryers also showing signs of neglect. An emaciated cat was found and it seemed apparent that it had not been fed within the last two months. More traps, which had been scattered around the forest, were found to have allegedly contained the remains of 12 martens, a wayward skunk and four foxes, thought to have been Logan's foxes, that had vanished from the cabin. The foxes had either been shot or attacked by a blunt instrument and then expertly skinned. Owen Morris came to the realisation that the men's sled, which was regularly used for transportation of food and equipment, had disappeared, and a further sense of dread washed over him when it was found that the pen holding Edward Logan's foxes was completely empty, and lying beneath some foliage in the corner of the trapper's shed was a bloodstained claw hammer. Deschutes County Sheriff Clarence Adams and the local game warden offered to help in the investigation and after a thorough search of both the cabin and its surroundings, the sled was recovered approximately a quarter of a mile from Logan's log cabin in a snowdrift on the icy shore of Lava Lake. The investigation took another sinister turn when it was evident that there were several dark stains on the sled, later confirmed by Dr George Vandervert as being human blood. There was a trail in the snow leading into the lake itself and a fairly large depression in the ice, but it appeared to have been frozen over. It was suggested that the sled had been taken over the frozen lake and then hidden in the snowdrift in order to obscure it from prying eyes. One of the search volunteers who wished to collect water for the group made a grim discovery. Frozen pools of blood were found in the thawing snow and among other evidence collected was clumps of hair and a human tooth. Sheriff Claude McCauley wrote in the official police report his thoughts of the chilling crime scene. Even though the weather was perfect, the clear air was impregnated with the odour of death and decomposition, and it was with an undefinable spirit of awe and consternation that the little party of hardy outdoorsmen laid aside their packs, kicked off their snowshoes and prepared to tackle a grim job which was little to their liking. Owen Morris and Clarence Adams later returned to the lake with the aim of catching some fish to feed fellow searchers. The duo were surprised when they realised that the lake had escaped from winter's unforgiving grasp, the thaw having melted much of the ice. The pair, alongside Edward Logan, took a boat out onto the lake in order to conduct further searches. A cap and hat were found floating on the surface of the lake, presumed to have belonged to the trappers. Owen, Clarence and Edward's attention was caught as they witnessed dark shapes floating on the lake. On that early April evening in 1924, the bodies of Nichols, Wilson and Morris were discovered. Wilson and Nichols, who was found to still have his glasses on, were floating face down, whereas Morris was floating on his back. The remains of the men were partially decomposed and, oddly, were wrapped in muslin. Owen, Clarence and Edward tied rope around each of them and hauled the bodies back to shore. Inspecting each of the clothed bodies, it became clear that they had all been fiendishly butchered. With dusk quickly falling, the corpses were kept overnight in an ice shelf before further personnel arrived to carry out further investigations. The following day, Clarence Adams travelled to Bend, seeking further assistance. After the arduous task of taking the bodies back to Bend, the coroner conducted post-mortem examinations on Nichols, Morris and Wilson. It was concluded that they all had perished in late December of 1923 or early January of 1924. Their deaths were caused by gunshot wounds and blunt force trauma. 
Nichols had a shattered jawbone and a wound to the head, both of which were caused by a bullet, likely from a revolver, and his watch reportedly ceased to tick at 9.10am. Wilson had been shot in his right shoulder and had suffered a shot to the back of his right ear. Morris had a gunshot wound in his left arm and had suffered a skull fracture. All three men had been bludgeoned, presumably by the claw hammer found in the fox pen at the log cabin. Police began their effort to piece the puzzle together and agreed on the following timeline of events. The killer or killers took a path to and from Little Lava Lake, passing Schumacher Fur Company in Portland by the road leading to the town of Lowell and the Mackenzie River Trail. At least two of the men were lured away from the cabin for reasons unknown and were subsequently murdered. The third was then killed within a close radius of the cabin for, once again, reasons unknown. Their bodies were then thrown onto the sled where their killer or killers dragged them for approximately half a mile across the frozen lake, digging a hole to then dispose of the bodies. The perpetrators then scarpered on foot back through the forest. It is a mystery as to why the men were slain, as well as who was responsible for their deaths. What baffled police was that Roy Wilson was an ex-Marine, who could have easily overpowered a person attempting to attack him. Therefore, authorities believed that the murders could not have possibly been carried out by a single individual. They were now seeking either two killers or one killer and his accomplice. A woodsman and moonshiner known as Indian Erickson fell under the radar of suspicion for a brief time. He lived in nearby Cultus Lake and was accused of committing the crime. However, there was firstly no evidence to support the idea and secondly, he had a solid alibi at the time of the Lava Lake murders. Edward Logan, the owner of the log cabin, suggested a name to police, Lee Collins, also known as Charles Hyde Kimsey, a man from Idaho with whom he had squabbles with in the past. Logan had conversed with Ed Nichols, who had told him a story about Kimsey, an Elk Lake Lodge employee, who had previously been one of his fellow fur trappers. Nichols and Kimsey had a rather heated dispute regarding a wallet, in which Charles Kimsey expressed a desire to get even one day. Nichols was relieved when he was told that he would be sharing the cabin with Morris and Wilson in the winter of 1923, as he was left a bit on edge after his confrontation with Kimsey. It was known that Kimsey was highly skilled with a rifle and revolver, which would support the theory of him being involved in the deaths of the three trappers. Charles was not unfamiliar with Oregon authorities, as he had previously been charged with robbery and attempted murder of cab driver Mr W Harrison, who Kimsey had overpowered in his vehicle and thrown down an abandoned well, after having attacked, bound and poisoned him. Harrison miraculously survived his ordeal, vomiting up the poison and escaping from the well. The case went to trial, however, Kimsey became a fugitive, with police offering a $1,500 reward for information leading to his capture. On the 22nd of January 1924, a mere seven days after the fur trappers were last seen alive, Kimsey was reportedly seen by a witness in Portland, Oregon. The witness was a traffic officer and Kimsey allegedly questioned them about where he could sell expensive furs and was directed towards Schumacher Fur Company. Charles sold approximately $110 worth of furs to the company. It was discovered that on the documentation used for the sale, the seller was listed as Ed Nichols and Kimsey had actually used Nichols' trapper's license. Due to this startling evidence, Charles Kimsey became the prime suspect in the murders. It wasn't until early 1933 when Kimsey was recognised by a jail warden in Montana when he was successfully apprehended by authorities. He claimed that he was innocent of the crime and stated that at the time Ed, Roy and Dewey were killed, he was working on the Moffat Tunnel in Colorado, which was confirmed by his employer. 
Upon questioning Carl Schumacher at the fur company about the man who had sold fur to them in January 1924, he unfortunately could not confirm whether the seller was definitely Charles Kimsey. As for the robbery and attempted murder charges, Kimsey was found guilty by the jury, despite pleading his innocence. He was sentenced to life imprisonment at Oregon State Penitentiary and was never charged in connection to the murders at Lava Lake. In 1957, he was released from jail on parole and returned to his native Idaho, where he lived the rest of his life without further incident. It was speculated that if Kimsey was responsible, his potential accomplice could have been Ray Van Buren Jackson, a school teacher who was allegedly involved in at least six other suspicious deaths in the 20th century, according to Melanie Tupper, author of The Trapper Murders, a true Central Oregon mystery. He had already been convicted of forgery charges in the 1890s and was given the moniker of the Angel of Death. Kimsey and Jackson apparently shared family ties as well as being friends, therefore does not rule out the possibility that he was somehow involved. Answers, however, will more than likely never be found as Jackson took his own life in 1938. Ed Nichols, Roy Wilson and Dewey Morris were buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Bend, Oregon. The cabin in which they shared their final days no longer stands, however the horrific crime continues to haunt those at Lava Lake and the people of Oregon. Despite the murders having occurred almost a century ago, hope has not dwindled that perhaps one day the truth can be uncovered. As of December 2019, the Lava Lake murder case remains unsolved.